So I'm Michael Kulikowski. I'm here with the 1968 Moments of Change program, and it's a pleasure to welcome you, Michael Rosenblatt, to the, um, the program. And I'm wondering if first you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience here at Penn State, and then I will have some questions. Sure. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am currently a semi-retired lawyer. Uh, it's, I've been a lawyer since I was 24 years old and have worked in a variety of positions and now I am of counsel to a real estate law firm in Manhattan working three days a week which is very nice at this point in my life. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, my mom and dad and the family, my sister and at that time one brother, I now have two, moved to Westchester County mm -hmm. uh, just north of New York City when I was in the fifth grade, I believe, and I spent the rest of my youth, so to speak, uh, in Westchester, and then decided to enroll, I wasn't sure where, Penn State was at the top of my list, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, a number of reasons. Um, I visited the campus and loved it. Um, I had cousins who were here. My mother's cousin was the uh, dean of the College of Science. Oh. And um, it was nice having family in town. And I must say, while not necessarily the most appropriate reason for determining where to enroll, I loved the football program. <laughs> so I decided uh, I was going to enroll at Penn State. Um, Out-of-state tuition then was the humongous $2,500 a year. <laughs> um, I could have gone to a state school in New York for free, but my parents were like, if you really want to go, you can. So I did. I enrolled here and then enrolled in law school right after I got out with just a summer off and then did a variety of law jobs to bring me where uh, I am now. Um, my wife, Karen, and I live in Manhattan, mm -hmm. in New York City. We moved from a few places in New York as our children were growing up. We have a son and a daughter, uh, Ben and Margaret. They're in their 30s. And uh, we are and have been for a number of years empty nesters. And we sold our house, coincidentally also in Ardsley, New York, where I essentially went to junior high school and mm -hmm. high school. Uh, we moved up there and sold the house about a year ago. And although we had an apartment in New York City while we had the house, for a number of years. Right now, it's delightful having but one residence and zero mortgage. Lovely. So it's, it's a nice way to spend the, um, you know, our senior years. Um, what else can I tell you? Well, I think maybe we can talk about uh, what it was like to come up here in 1964, is it? You got here? I came up here in 1964, as I think I had mentioned when Chris Gamble, uh, works with the Alumni Affairs mm -hmm. Office for Liberal Arts, asked me to just jot down a few notes about what it was like. I think I began by saying, um, and this was in June of 1964 mm -hmm. when I enrolled, not September. Right. So the timing was accurate in my narrative. Seven months after JFK was assassinated mm -hmm. and four months after the Beatles first hit America on the Ed on Sullivan, the Ed Sullivan show. show um, I, I had to leave for college in June, so I missed my senior prom and my high school graduation. <laughs> my dad went up and got my diploma for me, I, right. so I heard. Um, you know, no text messaging or cells in those days. Uh, and I arrived in State College, and I loved it. I was a little bit homesick, but I loved being here. Had you ever seen a town so small before? Uh, uh, yeah, I think... Actually, I shouldn't say that. Um, where I spent my adolescent years in, in Ardsley, it's a small town, certainly smaller than State College is right now. But back in the 1960s, State College was probably smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, the town has uh, exploded in terms of its size, not just the campus, mm -hmm. which is definitely increased in size significantly, not so much in perimeter, although it has to the west, mm -hmm. on the other side of uh, Atherton. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the, the school uh, then and now, of course, borders town, and 
town seemed to be, unless it was just my perception back then, a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, some restaurants, some bars. College uh, Avenue is two-way. Co <laughs> yeah, College Avenue was a two-way street, for sure. Um, and it, oh. it, it, it was nice just being able, from the dormitories or fraternity house, just walking into town. Um, yeah, it was it was it was delightful, and I have very fond memories of that. Now it sounds like you tried to pledge a fraternity, and, and uh, yeah, academically I, things didn't go quite as uh, planned. <laughs> things didn't go as planned. Um, I joined a fraternity and made what people told me was a bonehead move, <laughs> which was moving into the house mm -hmm. and starting to pledge. As opposed, as opposed to pledging while still living in the dormitory, where you know by nighttime you can go to your dorm, lock the door, and it's a safe haven until you have to go back to mm -hmm. the fraternity house. Uh, I had very little peace. Most of the brothers were delightful guys. My pledge class, they were delightful people. Uh, a couple of the brothers were like, you know, would, you know, make me stand at attention or do these stupid things. But whatever it was, I was so preoccupied with um, either trying to please or just trying to not get <laughs> beaten up, and I don't mean that literally, uh, that my studies, you know, went by the boards, and I wound up for that one term on academic probation. Mm -hmm. And my mom and dad said, um, you want to stay in fraternity? We think it's a bad idea, but if you do, you're paying for it. And I had no money. <laughs> I, had no, I had no source of income other than asking my parents to foot the bills for my college education. So I went back in the dormitory where I met some close friends, and we then moved into an apartment just outside of town where we stayed for the last two-plus years uh, of college. And that was, um, that was wonderful. How would apartment living differ in the 60s from what our... Uh our students experience nowadays? Students nowadays probably have more heat during the winter <laughs> than we had. Um, but it was, uh, it, it was nice. We had, I don't know what the current situation is with apartment rentals in town, but students back in the 60s, in order to attract students, property owners would offer nine-month leases from mid-September or, or 10-month leases. You know, it, it, you could start in September with a lease and the lease would end in June when the term was over. So you didn't have to worry about, do I have to sublet the apartment mm -hmm. for July and August? Am I going to have to pay the rent and it goes down the tubes because no one's living there? That was not the case. We had nine-month leases or 10-month leases. And we had, me and my friends and I, we were fortunate enough to have very nice and very expensive sports cars. <laughs> um, and you could park in many areas on campus that you can't park in right now. I understand that parking is somewhat limited. Um, the furthest away that I would have to park would be around East Halls. Mm -hmm. And that was like in the middle of nowhere, and now it's the middle of campus. Well, not exactly, but you know what I mean. It's, it's um, uh, there's a lot that's beyond these tolls mm -hmm. where there was nothing beyond these tolls back in the 60s. Um, but it was nice having a car. It was nice having, uh, we also had a couple of motorcycles. I don't know who owned them, but we all <laughs> used them. Uh, it wasn't mine. I didn't have a motorcycle, but I used one all the time. And it was a, a, a very free time. Mm -hmm. I got my work done way after that, you know, <laughs> terrible term when I pulled, mm -hmm. I think it was a 1.2 or a 1.4, and, you know, then I got my grades up and was taken off probation. Uh, it, was very, it, it, it was very nice having the car, having the apartment, having my friends, you know, having girlfriends, getting the work done, mm -hmm. and pulling my grades up. But you didn't have, in the dorms you had curfews, or was that simply for women? Uh, simply for women. Men could come and go. Women had curfews. Um, I, I think 11 p.m. might have been weekdays, uh, midnight on Saturday, uh, Friday and Saturday night. Um, there were 
not security guards, but there was would, what would be the equivalent of a house mother in a fraternity mm -hmm. or sorority sitting by a front desk. And if a woman student went out on a date, had to sign out and had mm -hmm. to be back by curfew. I don't know what the penalty was for breaching curfew. The guys really weren't concerned with that. And that might be different in this day and age. But, but guys couldn't go upstairs or weren't supposed no, to. No, we were least. not allowed upstairs. Um, and women who wanted to you know, spend the night at their boyfriend's house would just sneak out of the dorms after they had signed back in. Mm -hmm. um, that happened often. <laughs> uh, so the only thing that's changed for today's undergraduates is that those things are easier and the, the constraints are not. Oh, yeah, the, the constraints, yeah, they, they are easier. Uh, I, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are some, there are dorms that are co-ed, men and women mm -hmm. living together um, on the same floor or at least mm -hmm. in the same dorm. Uh, that did not exist back in the 1960s. Uh, what about the, um, what about the, call it social or drinking culture on campus, what was that, or, or indeed sex and drugs and rock and roll, as we think of the uh, 60s, yeah. you know. Okay, well, the rock and roll, uh, I think I did mention I uh, You're a guitarist. played mediocre guitar, yeah. <laughs> still play mediocre guitar, but um, uh, I, I, was, I was in a band that probably disbanded after a month or two. Um, and you know we, we we played at some dances and some of the you know the the, uh, the pub or the hub uh, you know not the pub uh, the East Hall's uh, central building oh. as well as the Pollock, uh, but that didn't last that long. But we listened to a lot of music. There were a lot of artists of note that uh, that, that came to play mm -hmm. at Penn State, and I saw many of them. Uh, most at Rec Hall. Um, so in the in the gym in, at Rec Hall. Yeah, in, in the gym at Rec Hall. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the Beach Boys, the Rascals, the Young Rascals, whatever they were called back then, um, and, and a lot of other people. Um, I can't recall too many names off the top of my head, but we went to see a lot of shows. It was very inexpensive, and. People blasted rock music out of the open dormitory windows. and didn't get in trouble for it, but you would hear music all the time. Eh, classical as well. Uh, I enjoy classical music, but th now, you mm -hmm. know, all sorts of musical uh, genres. But back then, it was mostly rock and roll. What was the source from which you got your rock music? I ask because uh, a lot of other alums um, have brought to our attention the fact that, that students today don't realize how personalized their listening is with their devices and computers, whereas you guys... We didn't have a playlist back in the 1960s. You would put on the radio, or you would have a, um, a, a cassette tape player, uh, or a reel-to-reel -reel player, mm -hmm. uh, or you would just have your turntable. And, and, and play either 45s or, um, or 33s, you know, regular size albums. And we had collections, and I had a lot of records. I had like a few linear feed of albums. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very nice listening to music all the time. Is this something that people sort of came together around and found their, their common? It was, it, yeah. It, it, uh, music was a common ground back mm -hmm. then, uh, as it is now. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, then there comes a time just to go ahead a number of decades. You get older, and like now, we move from a big house into a you know, to a small apartment, mm -hmm. divesting oneself of personal possessions. I gave my record collection to my son, mm -hmm. and uh, well, vinyl's back in you know <laughs> back in vogue nowadays. So. Oh yeah, I know vinyl is great, and I had a lot of really good vinyl. The records were one thing, but the, the jackets, the sleeves, mm -hmm. some of them are classics. Sure. Um, it's nice. I'm not going to take them back, though. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so one of the, uh, another thing that you saw at Rec Hall is really one of the most extraordinary well, things uh, in your account, and that yeah, is seeing Dr. Martin Luther King. 
uh, I did. It was, I don't know exactly when, it was either January or February, but I know it was the dead of winter in 1965, and 64, 65 was my freshman year. I was 18, I guess, 17 or 18. Um, and someone in my dorm said, hey, you know that, that civil rights guy, Martin Luther King, he's speaking in Rec Hall, you wanna go? Sure, why not? You know, I was uh, on the same page, to use the expression, as he was in terms of civil rights. And I knew who he was. I knew about the uh, problems throughout America, but most notably those in the South, in the, uh, well, throughout history, but I'm thinking in my frame of reference, the early 60s, mm -hmm. even when I was in high school. And in 1965, when I heard he was on campus, a friend of mine and I, we walked over from, I think we were in the Pollock dorms back then, we walked over to uh, Rec Hall, and as, as I mentioned briefly before, back in the 1960s, there was a real paucity of African American students on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, they were there, not a lot of them. I got to Rec Hall with a friend of mine, couple of white guys walking in, and there were others there, Caucasians, but it was a predominantly African-American crowd. We didn't feel out of place because we all had a kinship in what we were listening to. Mm -hmm. And I heard Dr. King. I saw him a little bit, but we got there late. We were way in the back. I didn't see him too well, although I did see him. Uh, I didn't have field glasses or binoculars <laughs> back then. Uh, but I don't remember his exact words. I remember the tone of voice. I remember the passion. And I remember thinking that this man is amazing. And, uh, you know, three years later he was shot. Uh, do you think it changed the mood on campus, having Dr. King come here and speak? Do you remember what the... I remember people talking about it afterwards. Most people because I, you know, especially back then, even now, most of my close friends were, were white, not black. Mm -hmm. I, had, I knew some uh, black students who were friends, more casual friends, but my closest friends were white, and they didn't go listen to Dr. King. Mm -hmm. This was a friend of mine and I, um, uh, who I know is now, um, yeah, well, he's he, he's he's a head of an OBGYN department down in some hospital in in, in Texas, but uh, he and I went over there and talked about it afterwards. But other people who he either heard us talking, I recollect people saying, "Oh yeah, you went to listen to him? Yeah, how was it? <laughs> like you know, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I it, it it was very it was telling." how it was just the beginning of the cutting edge mm -hmm. of, this was, this was just before the Civil Rights Act of 1965, I believe, or was it 64? I don't even remember the exact date. Um, but it was um, a time that there wasn't much racial tension on campus, mm -hmm. nor was there much of an awareness on the part of most whites, mm -hmm. I'm sure, on the part of the African American population, there was a feeling mm -hmm. of being marginalized, of being left out, mm -hmm. of in many respects, subtly or not so subtly, being discriminated against. Uh, what, what about the sort of um, social landscape of the town? I think you've mentioned that. Yeah, um, I was still. As you might use the word, pretty, you know, on the straight and narrow back then, although my politics were on the liberal side. Um, the town was fairly liberal, being a college town. But um, just today, I saw someone wearing a, you know, at the risk of sounding too political, a Make America Great <laughs> Again hat. Um, I was going to tell him I just saw a hat that said, uh, you know, the same red hat that said, 
she looked older than 14. And that's for Roy Moore. <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, but the, uh, the feeling in town was, as to a certain extent it might be now, I, I don't know, I'm not being here that often, um, it is, you know, Happy Valley. You're kind of removed from a lot of yes. what goes on in, you know, metropolitan urban civilization mm -hmm. as opposed to this isolated college campus. Uh, but it was more, in my opinion, on the liberal side than the conservative side. And then, of course, as you said about what it's like being, <coughs> excuse me, being in town, about a year after that, I mean, I, by then I had started, you know, avoiding visits to the barber shop. Yes. <laughs> and my hair grew very long. It was down almost to my waist. Uh, I had very long hair. And walking around town, once in a while you would get people, you know, pardon the expression, they go, you know, faggot. Or they'd say, are you a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I had written on my little narrative. I, I grew a beard, so that sort of like negated the gender argument. Right. But uh, uh, it was tough. You know, we would travel from State College to New York uh, on you know, the weekends occasionally or on you know, term vacations. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a number of times we didn't get served in restaurants mm -hmm. because we were hippies. Did Vietnam, which... The Tet Offensive and the experience of Vietnam, which yeah. you lived through on campus, yeah. did that um, exacerbate the right-left divide and the town-gown divide? It, in my opinion, it did. Uh, the town, I can't speak to that much, but on campus, there were... It, it's before wearing an American flag pin was a symbol of being a conservative. And I have worn them... Mm -hmm. And people mistake me for a, you know, a right winger because I have something which I think honors the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, back then, it, it wasn't common. Mm -hmm. You had to talk to people. And back then, 67, 68, well, the Tet Offensive was in 68. Uh, back then, there were many people who were in favor of what the government was doing in Vietnam, and they, in certain respects, were as vocal as the opponents of the war. Mm -hmm. We had rallies, we had, I don't know, get-togethers, gatherings, protesting the war, and there were counter-demonstrations. Support the government, support our troops. Mm -hmm. uh, Many people on campus, including myself for a time, had what I now consider to be a very warped opinion about young men's participation in the war. Mm -hmm. I used to have this uh, Pollyanna attitude, um, just refuse to go. If there are no soldiers, there won't be a war. How can you fight if no one, if everyone says, I'm not going to fight? But that wasn't the case. There was a draft. It was a war which a lot of people on campus, even then, recognized as racially divisive, mm -hmm. among other things. It was racially divisive because it was, in significant measure, an economic war. Mm -hmm. Those who were affluent and predominantly white, like me, find a way out of the draft. Mm -hmm. But people who were poor, and many of them people of color, had no recourse. They got drafted or even volunteered because they had a roof over their head, clothing, and three square meals a day. Mm -hmm. And they'd be cannon fodder in Vietnam. It was, I don't know if I want to call it racist, but certainly racial. Mm -hmm. 
the Vietnam War disproportionately grabbed its cannon fodder from those who were without means to get out of the army. Mm -hmm. Aside from my mother saying, you're not going because I will chain myself to you before I let you get drafted. Yeah, right, Mom, I know. That's, that, that wasn't going to happen. You got a deferral for coming to university, I right? got a deferral when I was on campus, and when I enrolled in law school, I was deferred for a little while and then became 1A, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you know, you're next. And then there was the draft lottery, I think in 70, maybe 70, 69 or 70. Mm -hmm. I was already out of school then, out of Penn State. And I had a low lottery number, so I was called for induction, and I flunked my physical, which was not, not too difficult. Um, for those who had the means, mm -hmm. you could get out of the army. Uh, and I did because I thought the war was wrong. Did you always think that, or was it something that, along with many other people, you came to realize after it as evolved. the 60s evolved? You know, we, were, we were in there since, um, uh, since, what, the French left in 1954, mm -hmm. I believe? And we gradually, you know, thanks to a little bit of President Eisenhower, but then certainly uh, uh, Kennedy, Kennedy yeah. and Johnson, um, escalated the war. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw the post about the, 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 the Pentagon Papers release. Great movie, very timely. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to realize that it was not a war mm -hmm. I wanted to take part in or that anyone should take part in. We should get out of Vietnam. And that was, it's hard to use the phrase prevailing mood, mm -hmm. but in terms of most of my friends and the people that I knew, they were also very mm -hmm. much against the war. And, and there were demonstrations on the, uh, on the, uh, hub lawn, the old main lawn, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the hub lawn, but um, there were demonstrations mm -hmm. against the war. Um, I joined uh, SDS, the Students for mm -hmm. Democratic Society. Um, I didn't, I ultimately, can, am, am I admitting to a felony now? I burned my draft card, but that wasn't until after I got out of Penn State. <laughs> after having signed it, General Douglas MacArthur. So, right. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I support America mm -hmm. completely, then and now. Mm -hmm. So I understand that you, um, well, Statute of limitations has passed by now, but you committed oh, a felony right, yeah. burning, uh, <laughs> burning your draft card. I guess that was a felony. I, um, and I don't believe when I was an undergrad, uh, it might have been right afterwards at some rally in New York, I, I burnt my draft card after having signed my draft card, General Douglas MacArthur. Um, but I decided, I, you know, that's the least of of any problems I might face. Mm -hmm. um, I had planned and I knew a woman in uh, Montreal mm -hmm. who offered me safe haven in her home if I had to leave the country mm -hmm. uh, rather than face imprisonment if mm -hmm. I were inducted and refused to take the mm -hmm. oath. Um, Did you have but, friends who went? Or from uh, yeah, I had a few friends. Uh, my uh, my cousin, who I loved dearly, he was uh, a Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Annapolis grad, mm -hmm. and uh, he went. He 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 did two tours there, there doing underwater demolition in Haiphong Harbor. Talk about a high Gosh. risk occupation. Um, but yes, I and, and I knew a few other people that went. Most of my friends, like me, got out of the draft. We knew how to get out of the draft. Uh, and we did, and regrettably, it was, as I'd said before, those who were poor, minorities more than others, who could not get out of the draft, wound up going and suffered a disproportionate number mm -hmm. of fatalities. Um, and my simplistic view 
when I was maybe a freshman or sophomore, what's the big deal? Just say no, I won't go. If everyone says no, we won't have soldiers, mm -hmm. we won't have anything to do in Vietnam. But that was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, it, it's uh, the, the universal soldier concept. I think Donovan made that famous mm -hmm. in one of his you know, 1960-something tunes. Um, I, I wonder if um, for today's students, today's, uh, you know, in a, again, in a politically, um, a politically polarized time, yeah. um, what do you think the differences are with uh, the discourse on campus, the way in which people who are on different sides of political arguments speak to one another? Um, were things better, different I, in the 60s? I think, and I, I can't speak to what actually goes on on campus now because I'm not here, but I am willing to bet there was m the, the two sides that were polarized back in the 60s are probably more uh, vehement and argumentative than they are now. Uh, you hear people saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for uh, Trump, we needed a change, whatever that might entail, and I support our president and everything he does. End of argument. And those who say, He's, he's a moron, he's an abomination, um, and uh, you know, you know uh, hopefully we can survive this horror show. Mm -hmm. uh, but without the, you know, the fighting, which sometimes erupted into a fisticuffs, mm -hmm. not that often, but uh, I did see fights break out between factions of uh, you know, get out of Vietnam now and uh, you know, you know, God bless America, support our troops. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought support the troops. Yeah, bring them home alive. You know, um, it was a tough time back then, especially. Um, you know, Michael, you're doing this about 1968, mm -hmm. the year I graduated, mm -hmm. and Vietnam escalated significantly. In then. that year, there was in January or February, you know, the the uh, the Lunar New Year, the, the Tet mm -hmm. the Offensive. Tet. Uh, which was terrible to live through as a bystander, heaven forbid, I mean, if you were there, what it was like to hopefully get through. And then in the spring, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, there were multiracial, multiethnic get-togethers filling up the old main lawn, thousands of people, mm -hmm. Uh, with, uh, I think we borrowed from the administration building from Old Main, you know, public address systems, and there were speakers mm -hmm. uh, denouncing how horrible this was. At the same time, urging calm. I know certain areas, certain cities, mm -hmm. you know, uh, New York, Newark, Newark. Detroit, mm -hmm. um, uh, was horrible uh, violence. Um, it, it had just bubbled over to the top, right. Bub bubbled over the top, and the, the the assassination of Dr. King was something that the African American community understandably couldn't tolerate, as was the reaction to most, you know, Caucasians who were, uh, you know, in the civil rights movement. Was there a, a need? Famously, James Brown went out in Boston and kept calm and stopped Boston the from rioting could, yeah. as best he could. And well, I mean, were, obviously, State College was a small town, and as you said, predominantly town. not African American, yeah. uh, even on campus. But were there, were, was there a need to to keep calm at that point? To, was there a sense of agitation? So. I don't. I don't think there was a sense of impending violence. Mm -hmm. it wasn't like in, in, in Newark. New Jersey or uh, certain areas of New York City, which were predominantly uh, African American, where there was significant disruption, mm -hmm. fighting, protest, and demonstration, uh, looting and burning. In State College, with maybe 1%, I'm just guessing, 1%, 2% of African American community, there was not. But was there a state of shock for everybody? There was a state of shock for most everyone. Even those, from what I recollect, who were not that in line with the civil mm -hmm. rights movement. It's like, my God, how could they kill him? Mm -hmm. um, 
What, you had left campus when Bobby Kennedy was shot later and in the year. Yeah, I think That's it was right around graduation weekend. Mm -hmm. I just know, because it happened to me the other day, I glanced at my diploma, it's on my wall with all of my certificates. <laughs> uh, graduation was June 15th, I don't remember, of 68. I don't remember, maybe you do, the date. You're, when was, you're going to get me here now on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> when was um, Robert Kennedy assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan? It was right around that time. I think it had already it happened. happened. Yes by a week or two. I know it was in June. Mm -hmm. And graduation exercises were June 15th. And that was terrible. And already, while on campus during the spring of 68, I became very involved with the McCarthy for President campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, people were in the Bobby Kennedy campaign. Uh, I was uh, a Gene McCarthy supporter. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did work here in the state college office mm -hmm. of McCarthy for president. As soon as I got out, I took a position in the New York City office of the mm -hmm. McCarthy for president office. I was throughout the Northeast. When I was here, and this anecdotally, the first time I ever flew, I'd never been in an airplane in my life. I left from the state college airport with um, a Vietnam vet, vet who was a pilot mm -hmm. and a few other people and we flew to Indianapolis to work, uh, to do some campaign work. The first time I'd ever been on a plane and he says, okay, we'll be, you know, you know reaching whatever, takeoff speed, lean forward. I said, you mean if I don't lean forward, <laughs> we're going to crash? And w we made it. Uh, and at that time, by the way, the State College Airport was a Quonset hut. <laughs> and that's it, you know, yeah, and a couple of private planes coming right. in and out. Uh, now I understand it's a major airport. I mean, it has commercial jets. Um, one of these days I'll fly up well, here. Although it's like, you know, you can't get there from here. From New, <laughs> from York. New York, you, you, you have to go to Philadelphia to go to or Detroit and then come back. Or D.C. Yeah, or D.C. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if it was a direct flight, I would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, but anyway, um, we flew to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And then I spent some time in Pittsburgh. When I got out of school, uh, I was in uh, Boston and a few other places, but worked primarily from the uh, New York City office during that summer of 68. Uh, so do you think then, it, yeah, I'm talking, No. And then, of course, you know, we know about the 68 convention. And, mm -hmm. you know, do you think you became politicized while you were here at Penn State, or do you think you came here with your... I think that's one of the things more, that, you know, people grow up in college. And yeah, find uh, more so than before I got here. Um, I did become more politicized when I was here. My first uh, maybe political awakening, and this was not necessarily involved, it was not involved with Vietnam, but just in race relations. Mm -hmm. And I recall this distinctly. In the summer of 1962, a couple of years before I enrolled here, I was with a group of people, with our biology teacher from high school. I was 15. And we had two station wagons with half a dozen guys, a teacher and a proctor. We drove down to the Florida Keys. It was supposed to be like a biology trip, uh, you know, doing various things. And it was a lot of fun. I'd never been south of New Jersey beforehand, and we stopped at a gas station. This, this was not in like way down south, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I saw three bathroom doors, you know, ladies, gentlemen, colored. And the, I didn't even try the ladies' room. The men's room was locked. I went into the one that said colored. I mean, and I, you know, relieved myself. I came out, and the owner of the gas station grabbed me by the shirt collar and cursed me out and said, if you ever do that again, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. I just needed to use the bathroom. He says, can't you read? Mm -hmm. yeah, all right. My color is white. I mean, I didn't say that to him. But. <laughs> and that was my first real lesson in what it was like down south. Mm -hmm. You didn't see that in New York. There was racism, of course, mm -hmm. but not restrooms and other places of public accommodation, 
that were restricted uh, by virtue of race. And it was a real eye-opener for me. And I got home, I told my parents about it, and they were like, yeah, that's the South. Hmm. I mean, my parents went through that, you know, being Jewish out mm -hmm. west during World War II, uh, when my father or mother was stationed in certain areas. Um, and it was an eye-opener as a 15-year-old, and then I got to campus as a 17-year-old, and gradually, with the escalation of the war, mm -hmm. I did become more and more politicized. Um, what do you think the legacy of those days is? I mean, either for you or for, for the rest of us, for the, for the country. The legacy of those days is, I hope that the students of today will look back, or as a professor, as an instructor, tell them to look back and talk to them about what went on back then, mm -hmm. how it's relevant now, and how they, they, the current students, have to take a stand. And, you know, of course, from my perspective, it's obvious from our discussion that, you know, I'm certainly much more to the left than to the right. But take a stand for what you believe in, but listen to others. Mm -hmm. You know, have an open mind. Um, and that's what, in my opinion, has to be done mm -hmm. right now with the students of today. I see a very lackadaisical attitude mm -hmm. in many and you can't do that. I mean, I see, you know, in New York, I mean, I live in the Upper East Side mm -hmm. and go down about 40 blocks to the you know, mid-40s to go to work, you know, a few days a week. And you walk out of your building, you walk to the subway, and everyone, if you see someone walking ahead of you and all of a sudden their gait is lower, their hands are like this, and their head is bowed, you know they're texting while they're walking. Mm -hmm. Everyone does it. I look at a subway car, see seven people sitting across from me. At least six will be on their gizmos. I have one, too. I have a cell phone. I look at it all the time, but not when I'm going to work. When I get to the office, it can wait till I get there. There is too much. Do you think we've lost the personal connection on it as a result of that? It, clearly, in my opinion. You know, it's, uh, you know, people might differ with that, but... I think there has been a loss of personal interaction. Mm -hmm. um, I have and still have a big box of all the letters that people sent to me mm -hmm. when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And presumably they have unless they've discarded the letters that I sent in return. And no one writes letters anymore. No. Well, I mean, I don't either. I, mean, right, I, right. I text or email, but... Uh, but is there some sort of, would you say some mindfulness or something has been lost in the process and the, for, for just with the speed of communication today? Or? This, yes, it, it, clearly. The speed of communications is um, astounding. <laughs> and I really think that, it, not to knock technology, and, you know, moving well into the 21st century now. But it would be very nice to have communication that's not on an electronic gizmo. Mm -hmm. um, it's so nice talking to people yeah. <laughs> instead of just, um, you know, you know t -t 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 hitting the send <laughs> button. Absolutely. There's one more, one more thing that I yeah. wanted to... And there are other things more about, not so much about political, you know, uh, uh, racial issues and, and, and political war issues, but there are just so many other wonderful things about my experience. Why don't you tell me some of them? What, what, what's, what's, your, what's your favorite memory? That's my my favorite memory... <laughs> oh, this is not a good one. <laughs> one of the, my most distinctive memories is with one of my best friends, the night before graduation, we went to gourmet food. We went to McDonald's or Burger King or one of the places that existed back then. 
we gorged ourselves and then got drunk <laughs> and then forgive me but we threw up on the old main steps <laughs> i remember that i can imagine <laughs> But it was like our swan song to Penn State. Um, uh, th that was my friend who ultimately, a few years later, uh, you know, uh, bought the Rathskeller. Uh -huh. He was the proprietor of the Rathskeller for a number of years until he sold it, you know, telling me that for someone who was heavily involved in the consumption of alcohol, uh, owning a bar was perhaps not the best occupational <laughs> choice. Um, and uh, he's no longer with us, but you know, I remember right. him fondly, you know. Of course. Do you have any other... And, and uh, well, okay, so, all right, I threw up the night before graduation. Of course, yeah. But <laughs> there were other wonderful memories. Um, you know, we, um, you, you mentioned, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mentioned briefly the rock and roll, and that, that throughout had been a constant. Of course. Uh, the How drug, about the drugs? The drugs, yes. the, the drugs were there. At that point, I mean, nothing beyond the alcohol, which we had to sneak when we were minors, mm -hmm. because... Uh, you know, in New York, you could drink when you were 18, but here you had to be 21. Um, but we were used to it as you know, teenagers in New York. You were allowed to drink; it was no big deal. But we did consume a good bit of alcohol uh, midway through my academic career here. Um, a, a pot was very prevalent mm -hmm. on campus, uh, and uh, you know, where I lived was you know no exception. We you know we managed to you know get grass. We rolled joints, we smoked, um, nothing much harder, maybe smoking a little bit of opium now and then, but it's no mm -hmm. nothing really harder than that. Um, I never did uh, and never have and never will, you know, inject anything into myself. Mm -hmm. Was that an issue on campus at the time? Uh, Later in the 70s, I think it might yeah, have Yeah, more, probably right. more in the 70s, but in the 60s, you read about people getting pulled over by the police, and if they sniffed marijuana in the car, then they'd be taken away in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened. And now, of course, State College is no longer enforcing marijuana laws. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, I, I didn't know they were no longer enforcing. I know it's still a little, it's not one of the legal states mm -hmm. like California uh, and Oregon and Colorado, but um, it, it's uh, with the exception of. Uh, what Jeff Sessions is now proposing, uh, it's, it, it's really, it, it's, as they say, no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but there were other drugs. I knew a number of people who used speed mm -hmm. and would also, um, and, and mainline it, which, ugh, terrible. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. I, I never did that at all. And, had I done it, I probably would have snorted it because yes. I, I'm pretty much needle phobic. I don't even <laughs> like my annual physical getting a, a blood, blood test. test. But um, uh, I never used uh, methamphetamines um, in college, uh, and certainly nothing stronger than mm. than, than pot and alcohol. Um, and cocaine had not really come to college campuses at that point. Cocaine was not not really an issue in the mm -hmm. '60s. Um, I understand it was in the probably the later 70s and into the 80s. I can attest. Perhaps that. still is. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and now you know I you know dabbled a little bit in that as a, as a you know a young adult after college. Um, now I wouldn't because of you know uh, you know I I, I don't want it to affect my heart. You know? Of course. I, of course. You know, it does speed you up significantly, and uh, it's just not, not healthy. Um, so the drugs were there. I, I, I had a girlfriend that did, uh, I don't know what they call poppers or is it mm -hmm. something, uh, amyl nitrate. Amyl nitrate, yeah. Uh, and I would see her do it and like, oh, I don't want to feel like that. <laughs> and I never did. Um, and she called me a wuss, or whatever the phrase was back then. Right, right. But I, ne I never did, I never did that stuff. And um, I mean, I hope she's okay now. <laughs> um, 
So there are any other things? In, 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 well, okay. No, no, I'm, I'm in, 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 in sex was casual. It was yeah. the 60s. Um, there was, a, it, 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 for most men and women, from mm -hmm. my perspective, and I, you know, I can't speak from, I can't speak generally from either perspective, only my own, but what I perceived was that um, sex was very casual. It didn't have to mean a lot. Um, it was just, you know, a release. And at the time, many women used birth control pills, which were just recently, since mm -hmm. the early to mid-60s, on the market, uh, I believe. I'm not exactly sure about the dates. And they... Uh, they meaning the women on yes. campus d did not th consequently have to worry about getting pregnant and men used condoms at times mm -hmm. and if it was oh are you on the pill oh okay mm -hmm. condoms were really not necessary AIDS was, had not reared its ugly head back mm -hmm. then and there was nothing that that a shot of penicillin couldn't mm -hmm. cure <laughs> in a few shots. Um, the um, the mood was just, you know, uh, you know, a girl would come out of her dormitory and you'd pick her up and um, and you'd spend the night. Mm -hmm. Probably not as much as my recollections would like to imagine, you know. <laughs> But, but but we did. We all had girlfriends, and um, a lot of times, you know, take your date back to the dormitory, and many times your date would stay over. Um, and people didn't really think much of it. How do you think gender roles have changed since the 60s, since you were here at Penn State? I, I think significantly, very significantly. Uh, there is, fortunately, much more an awareness of women's rights. I mean, I watched the Golden Globes mm -hmm. recently, and um, and and I, and I applaud many of those speeches that were made. Uh, it's it, it it it's time. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to talk about equality. It's another thing to actually, uh, you know, to live it, mm -hmm. to uh, to to advocate it uh, passionately. Uh, it should be. There, there, there's a, a gender gap in pay mm -hmm. for men and women doing the same jobs. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, it may sound trite, but the phrase just say no means that. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and that should be respected. Uh, we've been talking about gender roles and what may have changed or evolved over the years, yeah. now 2018, back to 1968. And one thing I remember, and you would not see this now, or mm -hmm. I'd be horrified to see this, the uh, university yearbook, La mm -hmm. Vie, uh, it comes out every year. My yearbook, I still have, the 1968 yearbook, and there are pictures in there, th like, you know, Bells of the campus, mm -hmm. you know, campus beauty queens. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of lovely young women on campus, of course. But to have them profile, fully clothed, not like Playboy, mm -hmm. but with the same kind of sexual bent, so right. to speak. Male gaze. Yeah, male, yeah. You wouldn't see that now. And there was, I know, one picture, and they had captions, funny captions on these pictures. Mm -hmm of a girl, I think sitting at the corner room, sipping a soda with her eyes raised, talking to a professor. Like, do I get an A now, professor? You wouldn't see that now. And one would hope thankfully. one would not, yes. Um, and that was 50 years ago. And that was acceptable back then. And it's not right now, should not be right now. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. The, 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 something that's changed for the better, at you, least. You, you, would, you wouldn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, let, let me ask you about your experience with the '68 Olympics, and I think oh, one yes, of your friends I, was uh, an athlete. Well, um, someone who I had met on campus, but he wasn't really a, a, a close friend. But back in, uh, to digress for a moment, 
football was, of course, always the of course. king of sports. You know, that, that was, was then and is now the number one sport mm -hmm. on campus. The number two sport was men's gymnastics. Uh, the coach then, the you know, actually recently deceased uh, Gene Whetstone, had an incredible program, and he had a number of national championships, mm -hmm. NCAA national championship gymnastic teams. The, the, the gym meets were in rec hall, and you had to get there early to get a seat because it was packed. I don't know how if seats, 5,000 people. Maybe. I don't know how many people can fit into rec hall, but they always filled it up. And in the late 60s, uh, we won a couple of national championships, and I remember uh, one of the gymnasts, uh, Stephen Cohn, mm -hmm. uh, was the NCAA all-around uh, gymnastic champion in 1967 and or 68, one, the other, or both of those years. And, and uh, Karen, my wife, she, she needed to see a, a dermatologist about something, something very minor, but I saw that Stephen Cohn was a, uh, a, a dermatologist at um, uh, a Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. So we made an appointment and I went with her and I spoke to him, you know, during or right after the examination and mentioned that, oh, I, we were con Penn State contemporaries. And he said, oh, did you go to the gymnastic meets? And I said, I went to every one. You were incredible. And he smiled, you know, for the recognition that, you know, I, I was aware of who he was. Right. And he was, he didn't medal, but he was in the 1968 Olympics. He was on the American gymnastics team. Mm -hmm. And he said it was quite an experience. And he does, you know, he works out now and he's in great shape, but he's no longer a competitive <laughs> gymnast. I mean, he's obviously my age, give or take a year. And, um, and he's been, um, the, you know, the, the major dermatologist in, um, in New York City since, uh, uh, he got out of uh, uh, med school, mm -hmm. and by, which, by the way, as soon as he got out of college, he enrolled at, uh, at Penn in mm -hmm. the medical school right after college, and he went to the 68 Olympics while he was a med student. How he kept up with his medical studies That's fantastic. And, and trained to be competing in the Olympics, I don't know, but he did. And then he concentrated more full-time once the Olympics were over. Well, I'm hoping we get a chance to talk to him as well in this series. <laughs> yeah, uh, perhaps, and uh, I can give you his contact information. Um, but it was a pleasure being on campus in the 60s. There was an evolution from being aware of racial issues, the Vietnam War most significantly, um, male-female relationships, everything about the experience which was endemic to the process mm -hmm. of growing up, I experienced as did my, my friends. Um, we, we drank, we, we, we smoked a little pot, uh, and we had a very good time despite the cloud of the Vietnam War mm -hmm. always hanging over our head. Uh, we grew, we had a wonderful time here, uh, we, did, we did good things, we did some very stupid things. One winter day, I, you know, winter, I put on shorts and a t-shirt and took the motorcycle into town. And <laughs> people said, you're an idiot for doing that. And yeah, it probably was. <laughs> but, you know, I was, you know, you, you, you learn from doing some stupid things when, <laughs> in, in your youth. And right now, I'm sure young people still do some stupid things. Hopefully, there is an awareness among them of what's going on in the world around them. Uh, we, meaning older people, are training the younger generation, hopefully, or guiding the younger generation, who are gonna be our future leaders. Hopefully they have a perspective of how fragile the world is. You know, we have, you know, you know, 99 point something percent of scientists agree that 
you know, human-caused climate uh, problems cause climate change. Yes. Um, that's got to be addressed. Um, that's one reason why what I do um, is work with the mentoring program in liberal arts, and I talk to young people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and young people, college students, as they're graduating and getting out from whatever college they happen to be in, arts and architecture, liberal arts, mm -hmm. engineering, uh, science, should join their own college alumni mentoring programs mm -hmm. and work with younger students, um, or work with you know, current students, mm -hmm. and discuss with them how they can you know, make the world better help them answer their questions, give them the benefit of your life experience, which you know, the 25-year-old you know, graduate is, doesn't have the life experience of you know, someone who graduated 50 years ago like right. me. But um, it's important that we grads, including those who are due to graduate very shortly, mm -hmm. give back. That's why I'm on the board of the College of Liberal Arts Alumni Society because it's important that we give back. It's for the benefit of our children and grandchildren. That's great. I'd like to thank you for helping, I think, um, today's students feel empowered to give back and feel empowered to go out and, and as you say, mm. do well, things for, they should. for well, the good. Yeah, you're most welcome.